What's up? We're up late. I'm Max. This is Jesse and this is Jordan. been playing together for probably how long maybe like six seven years in um in a couple other bands and then um towards the end of last year we've been working on a bunch of um a bunch of music together so we wrote i think about 60 demos um and then come uh like april may we actually came to this studio love hurts and we recorded friends um and uh we actually didn't have a name at the time but uh one night when we were actually recording friends I was in the vocal booth, more kind of like spitballing uh, different name ideas. And it was about like three or 4 a.m. And um, Jack actually said, up late. Um, and that's, I guess, how we kind of came up with the name. That was the only one that kind of really stuck, so, so yeah. So um, we started writing that song in my bedroom. So I live above an old gym in a brothel in an industrial state, it's an old brothel. Um, so it's like a pretty like decrepit looking building. And I think that some of those ideas and, and that whole like dark dim vibe um, really funneled its way like into the, the actual song and the whole aesthetic and the feel of it, like lyrically and sonically. But yeah, so we started uh, writing that in my bedroom. Then a couple months ago, we took it back here to Love Hurts and we re-recorded the song with um, Nat Sherwood, our producer. And uh, we did it over a few weeks. Um, it was a bit of a longer process than, than Fred, Friends originally was. Um, just because I feel like we were trying to mix a lot of different sounds. We wanted, to have, we wanted it to have that kind of 90s boy band kind of vibe, but still feel very much like a, a kind of a modern pop trap song. Um, so yeah, we spent a lot of, no pun intended, late nights in the studio working on that and trying to make sure that we could actually kind of fuse all that influence and everything that we wanted to do to make the best product. So yeah, it was a little bit longer than Friends, but yeah. The song, lyrically, is supposed to mirror someone actually freaking out over three minutes because their partner um, didn't reply to a text. So we wanted to funnel that idea into the aesthetics and into the video. So what actually happens is um, the five of us leave a club. Um, I walk outside, meet the boys, turn back around thinking that my girlfriend's with me. Um, she's not. And I go into this kind of obtuse panic attack moment where I actually paralyze um, and fall backwards. And then I'm taken on a journey through Wollongong and its surrounds as I'm floating away in this kind of uh, anxiety induced paralysis um, as I'm as I'm singing and, and reciting the lyrics so um, it's kind of a visual metaphor for, for how anxiety makes you feel especially um, in relation to relationships and loved ones. Well we started the band during quarantine so we had to do a lot of stuff remotely so I think most of the time it just kind of happens organically in someone's bedroom right like maybe I'll come up with a song idea or maybe Jesse will come up with a riff or Jordan will come up with something on the piano we'll pass that together like through a group chat and then we'll kind of just work out which demo or which idea we actually want to pursue then we'll take that to the studio and bring it to Nat our producer and we'll kind of funnel through these ideas and work out what we think is best and, and, and what we think is most up late if if that makes sense. With those demos that we wrote, and we're still writing demos at the moment, but they kind of span like a lot of different genres. So we kind of almost go super broad and super wide with the sound. Um, and then we bring it back together in the studio with him, with the group of us. Um, so yeah, it feels like it's normally comes from an individual pass back to the wider group. And then that's how we kind of um, round it out and make it form or, or form it to the up late kind of aesthetic and sound. Yeah, there's going to be a, a lot more experimentation, I think. We we arrived at this sound because we, like I said, we've been playing in bands together for years, um, especially on like the heavier rock spectrum. 
um, and they always had that kind of emo influence. But on top of that too, I mean, like I started playing in bands when I was 14, with Jesse and Jordan much the same. Um, but at the same time, I was also producing a lot of trap beats for artists like Bones, Louis Knox. So I had this, um, this like my right foot was in rock and heavy music, but my left foot was in rap and, and trap and production. Um, and I'd never really been able to kind of fuse those ideas together. And it wasn't until we all started demoing together that I was actually able to start to, you know, print some of my like trap and pop influence. Then Jordan was able to kind of like print his, you know, more pop influence with like bands like The Neighborhood in 1975. And then Jesse kind of rounds it out with more of like the emo rock stuff. So I think that was the first time that we didn't have borders and we didn't have genres and we didn't have um, the necessity to create something that was rock because, you know, the label wanted rock or our manager wanted rock music or someone wanted like, you know, like a heavy song. We were actually just able to create what we wanted to create. And that was how we were able to fuse all the different sounds. But I mean, like in terms of like further experimentation where we're doing a lot more in, in the studio with, you know, heavier distortion, weirder sounds, um, the bringing in like uh, collaborators and songwriters and to, to kind of create music and, and cross um, more scenes and more genres. So, so yeah, there's going to be a lot more experimentation. A lot of trial and error. <laughs> yeah, LA has a lot of trial and error with it, yeah. I feel like we, instead of trying to like come up with these like obtuse grand metaphors and ideas, a lot of the, the song lyrics are um, things that happen to people like day to day. Like You Left Me On Red is, is almost like this huge joke. It's not, it's not supposed to be serious, like the whole idea of someone thinking that they should be better off dead because someone didn't reply to a message is ridiculous and I think that that's kind of the joke that we play on, like similar with Friends, like that song is just about telling a partner that you want to break up with them and that you guys should just be friends and the song is so grand and so dramatic and I think that that's how we connect with listeners is they love like the sound and they love the grandiose vibe and, and sonics of the music but then when they actually read the lyrics they're like okay wow like they're actually just kind of speaking in generalities or they're, they're, they're speaking to really simple ideas that I connect with and things that happen to people on a day-to-day -day basis we never we never pretend like we're going to talk about or, or address like some crazy <laughs> intense issue or serious motive behind the song lyrics. It's all very tongue in cheek and fun. So I think that's that's how we connect with that whole like boy band vibe where, you know, the, the song lyrics are silly, um, but the music feels very like grandiose and obtuse. And I think that that's, that dichotomy and juxtaposition is how um, I think we translate to, to the audience that we have in, you know, in our like total infancies. I think that, that we, bending genres um, that a lot of Aussie artists aren't are touching like in in isolation of each other um, I think that the way that we're able to fuse our emo rock um, background with this kind of trap influence is something that I don't think is happening um, to a wide or it's to a broader audience in Australia and we're almost trying to fill that gap I mean like artists that that we're super into like I mean like in Dior Black Bear, although we do it in a slightly different way, that 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 feeling and, and, and that idea behind the way that they're kind of like crossing genre is what we're trying to give to the, the Aussie music scene. Um, so yeah, I think the fact that we have such broad influence and, and, and are trying to tie them together in our own kind of way, like I mean, I, I feel like a lot of artists at the moment are are trying to do pop in the way that we're trying to do it as in like you know we do want to create music that's catchy but we don't want to just have like you know like a bubble gum like cookie cutter structure or sound to it we actually want to kind of push it um into some more industrial like in your face sounds and and especially like with the whole like aesthetic and the vibe as well like i think there's that cool kind of dichotomy between like the the popular like um you know bubble gum pop boy band but then also this industrial in your face um, rock vibe as well. So I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> it is, it is. Like it's fully ridiculous. Like it's it's um yeah, I think I like that that there's it, it almost feels like a bit um yeah, obtuse and and not unnecessary, that's the wrong word, but it is kind of like this 
this kind of grandiose idea for some for some song lyrics and a vibe that traditionally is not um, very deep. Oh, that's a good question. Wow. I'm trying to work that out. Um, we do we did have plans to tour um, in October, but obviously with the pandemic we weren't able to. So that was going to be a full um, Australian tour. But hopefully we can do that again next May. Um, we're looking at doing something in. In, a, in another city in, in October. Um, but in terms of like what the, the live show looks like, that's kind of what we're yeah, working on that at the moment. Yeah, I think like the idea of adding more of like the rocky elements to the live show is something that I feel like would kind of set us apart in terms of, you know, the music in the studio is quite polished and produced. But if we were to actually go to a show, I still want it to have, and we still want it to have that kind of like punk rock ethos and energy. I don't want you to rock up to a show and it just kind of feel like it's just a band with, with tracks. Like I think it's important that we still have this kind of raw energy to it. It should be an experience too, as yeah. opposed to just hearing exactly what you hear on the recording. Yeah. You get an extra layer. Yeah, yeah, I think that's super important. I think like um I don't consume, I don't, I don't want to speak for everybody, but we yeah. don't really consume music, um, you know, back to front on an LP. Um, I just, I think in the world of like, of playlisting and Spotify and Apple Music, singles are king, you know, a, a lifespan of a single is probably like no more than six weeks, um, to be honest. So I feel like all we want to do is we just want to have, we want to put out the best song that we have at the moment, instead of trying to think about it as like a full package. So we just do song by song by song. And we just know in of ourselves, is this the best song? Cool, all right, we're gonna put it out you know, in a couple of weeks. We'll see how that goes. And then we'll put out the next song, the next song, the next song. We just wanna be um, uh, like a television show that, that never stops. Like we're just episode after episode. There are no seasons, like we just never stop. That's at least how we're gonna approach it. I think maybe we might package something eventually, but I don't foresee us in a long time, you know, working towards a big project. I just don't think that it's realistic. I think it's way more fun just to like put out like the, the best song that you have at the time and just work song to song. I think you could look at it as like an exploded version of an album or an EP as well. Yeah, that's because a good there, idea. There is thought put into what song's gonna come after this one or what's what's more appropriate to follow up with the prior single. Like there's the same way that you would with a track listing on an LP. Justin Bieber. <laughs> oh, Justin Timberlake. Mine are Ed Shikari, silver chair. Not what you'd expect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think maybe like the neighborhood. Kanye um, and Charlie XCX. Uh, Ed Shikari and Daniel Jones. Um, I think I'd like to work with uh, Maddie and George from 1975. There's hell. Believe me, I've seen it. Um, 
There's Evan with Keep It A Secret, Green Horizon. Oh, and then Yeezus Kanye. That's like my favorite album of all time. So. I have to say Frog Stomp by Silverchair because it was the first album that I got like religiously into. Are we just always going to say Silverchair for it's, you and it's Kanye just, for me? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, Grease, um, the new Drake song's really good. Uh, that might be... Oh, Angels and Demons, Jaden. That's the best song I've ever Sad, aggressive, silly. Oh, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> Blade Runner. Mm. Mad Max. Yeah, that's good. Miley Cyrus. Miley. Miley Cyrus is fucking dope. <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. Yeah. We have to go like for like production value. Um, yeah. With Horizon, Cutest Bank Arena. That was probably. Yeah, that's my best. I think maybe when I saw like Foo Fighters a couple of years ago, just in terms of like the scope and the, just everything about it was just so spot on. Ah, uh, yeah. The presets at yours and Alice as well. That was dope. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, in Turnstile and uh, Oh, at Unify. At Unify, yeah. That was dope too. Oh, yeah, that's pretty, pretty high up. That's also pretty honest, high up. That was yeah, that's fine, really yeah. yeah. I don't have any guilty music players. Um, Everybody knows that I listen to terrible music. Like, I really like Taylor Swift. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, nothing's, nothing's guilty for me. Yeah. It's all out in the open. I don't know. I, I like, I'm a huge like um, Justin Timberlake fan. So yeah, that's that's mine. That's, that's it. probably that's the that's 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 best. Yeah, hundred percent it. Spice Girl. Spice Girl. That's shitty Spice. Uh, <laughs> um, you name us. I'd be sorry, Spice. <laughs> uh, John wouldn't be sexy, Spice. Why Spice? Why <laughs> Spice? I'm just gonna go with Ant Shikari again. <laughs> Until it happens. It's um, putting it out of the universe. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, maybe like a reunion of InSync. Drake's crazy. Drake's independent now. He's gonna break the music industry because he's gonna earn too much money and no one's gonna have any power over him. So yeah, Drake is Drake is breaking the mold, so he's my person. Also Frank Ocean, I think. Oh yeah, Frank Ocean, yeah. Don't fuck up between now and then. <laughs> yeah, um, start this band then. <laughs> I'm gonna be the exact same spot that I am in now. Be real. <laughs> <laughs> so. My older cousin at the time, I had an iPod shuffle, um, and uh, he loaded music for me via his um, iTunes account. This is going on like maybe like 14 years ago. Um, it was like iPod shuffles when they were like really long um, and he loaded it up with heaps of Ludacris, um, Eminem and Wu-Tang uh, and that's and I was just rapping along to all those songs so that's when I knew that I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to do it since I was maybe like first grade so I don't really have like a, a exact moment it's just been a like a constant yeah i think it's the same for me it's just always been a thing <laughs>